Investment has worked in history to make the world a better place. Uh, we got off slavery in the United States uh, about 100 years ago after a fierce fight about what was legal to sell. And eventually we decided it was illegal to sell humans. Uh, great advancement. But for a long time, they struggled over that. Uh, and the abolition movement had to demand that people wake up to their moral conscience not to enslave other races. Um, we just saw a thing about Frederick Douglass the other day and how he pushed his society forward by demanding that they take a moral account of themselves. And that is the same call that we have to do in our era. We have to insist on a moral culture that lives, that plans for the future. We're not at all doing that now, and it's um, not righteous. It's not right. We have a right to demand a livable future, and um, it's just frankly immoral to keep investing uh, when the oceans are 40% more acidic than they used to be, and, and so forth. Um, so um, just to introduce who's going to talk, we have Todd Walker here from Progressive Asset Management. He's going to introduce us to uh, divestment 101 and how to, you could take your money out of um, fossil fuel stocks. Bill LeBerge will be presenting on uh, opportunities for solar investment. And we're going to hear a little bit about promoting organic farmers, so investing forward. And uh, that's about it for maybe as an introduction. And maybe I'll come back and hit it, or hit it later. Um, but Todd, you want to come say a couple words? Sure. Green. Okay. You won't be famous well, for five is miles. It, is it live right now? Shot, you know? Is it live right now? <laughs> it is. Greetings. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go over this pretty quickly because it's, it's fairly basic, but for those at home, um, I developed this talk because uh, as a divestment movement really got uh, underway, um, we manage money uh, on a regular basis, and I'll get a little bit of what we do, but we get a lot of people saying, I just want to divest, and I just want out. It's very similar to about Ten years ago, when we had people come and say, "I'm going to put all my money in solar," uh, I really believe in solar. And as an investment professional, there's always we have to sit, sit back and talk about balance and, and you know basic investment principles. And so I came up with this talk because I wanted to. Uh, we're obviously in the divestment side, but at the same time, it has to be done in the right way so you don't uh, harm your portfolio. So that's really this is a tactical kind of approach. I, and I also want to tie it back to social responsible investing because divestment has been part of SRI for, you know, for 25 years. Who is Pam? Very briefly, um, we're the nation's largest network of advisors specializing in SRI. with has 7,000 clients. Um, we're really one of the first that was a, a full service investment firm that decided just to do SRI. Um, it was, it, it's funny because the divestment movement keeps talking about apartheid and Pam is a product of that era, uh, the, the mid-80s, where apartheid galvanized the investment community, and there were people doing social responsible investing at various major firms, you know, Merrill and Morgan Stanley. And they realized when uh, apartheid came together and there was this great uh, interest, they said, you know, why don't we just start firm, forming firms that just do SRI? Really the first group that decided to divest were the Quakers. This was the beginning. They would not um, invest and put their money with anyone who was doing slavery. Or Theo went there. Um, so it was, so it, that was all very good. I liked that beginning very much. Um, uh, the three hundred and fifty dot org is really just the latest major divestment campaign. There's been many divestments from tobacco, etc. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was originally directed at college, college endowments, now it's bringing pension plans, individuals, and you know the goal, which is a two, the goal of really of three hundred and fifty dot org. 350.org is to have the largest 200 companies leave their assets in the ground. We call it divestment in the nick of time, in the sense that you had this gigantic drop in oil oil stock prices uh, through the fall and, and early winter. Um, and the call for fossil-free divestment was actually very timely from an investment perspective. Uh, it just so happens. Um, and there's some reasons for that. A lot of it is oversupply, but I think a lot of it is because the divestment movement has put a shadow of doubt uh, into the investment community as to maybe there is something to the stranded assets thing. That maybe, you know, these companies aren't worth quite what they say they are because they'll never be able to pump all this stuff out of the ground. So that's a typical investment reason as to why divestment makes sense. That there be, there's either, you know, in this particular case with oil, it's declining reserves, social objections to use, declining business, uh, and stranded assets. 
biggest force in social responsible investing is actually institutions and colleges and endowments. They've got the big money and they made the big, just like apartheid, that was the, the biggest uh, impact against South Africa is the pension plans pulling out. So here are the fossil free funds as they stand now. The Green Century funds, uh, totally top fossil free. They um, were in the right place at the right time because they'd always been fossil free. Um, and so they are, um, you know, this has been a good, a good thing for them and for everyone. Uh, but they only have two funds, so that makes it a little, you know, restrictive. Pax World Growth Fund, they've decided that one Pax World Fund is, uh, they've decided to do a fossil free. I'm uh, sorry, two, and then there's the global environment markets. Shelton Green Alpha is a new fund in the West Coast. Portfolio 21 has been around for a long time there in the West Coast. The Alternatives Fund is really fossil free simply because uh, they've always, <laughs> you know, they've never been into oil and they're always into, you know, new alternative energy and things like that. So it's almost by default they would be. And same with the Calvert Global Water Fund. Water can't be oil, so it's by default. Um, a global alternative energy. Par Parnassus decided to make one of their funds uh, fossil free. Um, and something, you can pick ATFs. Uh, do, they, do people know what exchange traded funds here are here? Anybody? You do? Um, exchange traded funds are simply a collection of individual stocks and bonds that trades like one stock or a bond uh, on the markets. So you can just buy it, and there are certain advantages versus mutual funds. Um, but I won't go into big explanation about that. But there are a lot of exchange traded funds that, because they're cheaper to run, they can be much more targeted on the investments that they do. That's why you'll see exchange traded funds do just solar or just wind, because they're a lot cheaper to run than a mutual fund. And mutual funds can't, can't uh, they need a certain a large number of investors to survive. Anyway, something like the Environmental Services Fund is mostly waste, waste management, waste collection. So again, that's not going to be, that's not going to be fossil free. So there's not that many choices. Um, and this, the last thing is, you know, you can use a financial advisor if you want to do uh, social responsible investing. I'm sure you know about that. Um, and the only thing I'll bring up on this is that there's certain advantages of having an advisor. Um, but in the social area, uh, if you're going to choose one, they should be able to have a social questionnaire so they can actually get, and you can tell them exactly what matters to you um, and what to avoid and what you want to prefer. Uh, they should have wide access to social, social investments. Um, they should be able to provide social research in any individual investment uh, and proxy voting advice, which is something we do because a lot of people uh, have these portfolios uh, either they've they built themselves or acquired or been, they've inherited, which is a whole um, you know, uh, rack of single uh, individual securities and they keep getting these proxies and they want to know how to vote on them. Um, and, uh, and one of the things you'll see in those proxies are these shareholder resolutions I talked about. So I think you know about that. So this is down, finally, we're getting to the investment part. Um, I get the feeling, again, that most of you know this kind of thing. But when you start, when you wade into this, what I get from clients is, they, well, I want to be fossil free. So how far do you want to go? Uh, do you want to do just the 200 companies from the carbon tracker, 350.org? with the largest reserves in the ground, or just coal. Now, Stanford University was clever because this divestment thing is a real political, again, in football and all these universities because they've got people who, you know, they may have Exxon donating money to the school. They've got some students who are Republicans, some students, students are Democrats, so it's a very tough one. And, and that's why it's been not many, not that many colleges have, um, have gone fossil free totally as of yet. Some of the small ones that are more alternative uh, have, but the larger ones are kind of tiptoeing in. Well, um, one thing that's interesting about the 200 companies from the Carbon Tracker is that you, and, and why it's not that hard to divest, which I'll keep getting into, is that 100 of these companies are coal. Oh. So it's like, boom. I mean, <laughs> coal is, I mean, it, it's still being used quite a bit in utilities, but gas is replacing it. And coal is really, I think, the major I mean, major target of all the solar in the end. Because in, in some ways it's interesting that, that, that the amount of renewables that have been sold are really not influencing um, the oil, uh, because oil and, and are not, is not used by utilities anymore. They don't burn oil very, or very little. Anyway, so 100 of the companies in the carbon track are coal, so that's an easy one to get rid of. And so some people, I do have clients that will say, well, uh, I, some of them are actually in endowments that say, well, um, Really, we're okay with oil as long as they're in light oil. You know, if they're really trying to clean up, they've really got, you know, they have a solar division or something. Well, we don't want coal. 
So when you start defining, you have to define for yourself what is fossil free. Is it just coal? Is it all fossil fuel companies of any size? Um, is it natural gas too? Because natural gas, for many years, uh, was considered, considered to be social because it was a, a transition fuel. It was viewed as a way to at least get off of oil or, or heavy oils um, on the way to renewables. So natural gas was okay. And then you get down to, well, is it drillers and refiners, or what about pipelines and transporters, that people who don't actually pull it out of the ground, are they okay? Um, and how about fossil fuel service companies like uh, Schlumberger, you know, people, you know, build the drills and build the ships and all that, but don't actually, they're just, they're just supplying the, the equipment to the industry, is that okay? And what about lenders? Then you really go and you start expanding this out and out and out. If you have lenders to the fossil fuel companies, I mean, that's all, pretty much all the major banks, which you may want to avoid anyway, I don't know. So that's the first step is, you know, where, where do you draw the line? And that's true of so much divestment that we go, that we go into. Um, the next step is you have to screen your current investments. Uh, if we talked about it before, individual stocks and bonds uh, for fossil free participation, mutual funds, and ETFs, for that, you're going to go to the current holdings, very easy on their website. They'll say they'll show you the top ten, and then they always have a little bottom and the bottom, a little button to put in the bottom says all holdings. And you claim typically they're not going to advertise all the holdings in a way because uh, they don't want everybody to know exactly what they're you know what they're holding. I mean, they want to, it's their secret sauce to a certain extent. I this is this could be a talk all by itself, and I realize I've taken up half the thing. Am I okay? Yeah, maybe wind it down. Yeah. Why did I wrap it up? Okay. All right, then I'll go over this quickly. There are other presenters that are... No, I know. I'm sorry. Bears, I can tell. It's just itching to get I know. I know. I know. He keeps flashing a mirror in my face. That's all right. Um, and this was... I know. So this was... This is only a fraction of what they've written the whole talk. Is. But anyway. So this is the thing. This is what I was talking about. So, okay, you have this this portfolio, and someone says, I just want to divest. I'm just, I'm just really either excited about it or upset or, you know, sick of the oil. So then as you start doing that, uh, you have to be very careful and on all these levels. These are all you know, things to talk about on every port any portfolio, any portfolio, um, before you're going to start moving money around or even construct it. These are the issues you have to look at. And things come up right away, which wouldn't occur probably to the non-professional, but to the professional would. Uh, I want to get rid of oil. I want to get rid of all the oil, and I want to put into scenario and I want to put in it into solar and wind and, and as soon as you do that when you look at a, a allocation for a typical portfolio you're going to have large companies mid companies small companies uh, you're going to have bonds uh, value growth I mean these are the sorts of things we do as we create and construct a portfolio you know the pie chart well if you're going to take these large oil companies which are large caps and suddenly take all that money and move it into solar either individuals or even ETFs or something or mutual funds You've now skewed your portfolio from being, you know, as much as we may dislike the oil companies, they are stable. And so if you, you know, they're stable, they're large, and they're reliable to a certain extent until recently. Um, but if you're going to go and switch all that to small companies, these are very volatile. And, could, and, and thinking of Evergreen Solar and others that are going bankrupt. So you have to think about asset allocation. You have to think about taxes because, of course, if you're going to take an inherited portfolio or something that was even worse given to you, uh, while, while the uh, donor was still alive, so that it was not reset for capital gains, you could just say, I'm, that's it. I've seen this happen. I've had people come to a portfolio and say, I did, I did it in my uh, previous brokerage, and now it's all in cash, and I want you to invest it. And I say, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> wait a minute. You, you, you just sold it all, you know, like whatever it was, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're going to hit with a whopping capital gains tax if these are depreciated. So you have to, as you start selling out, you have to think about your taxes. You, have to, you typically restagger it. You're going to sell this over time, so many, so much a year, and or so you know, you've also got fees. If you were to sell this in a commission account, the charge is commission. You could be, you know, uh, hit with large commission costs. So you have to think about fees. How do I stagger that? Dividend income. Back to that that uh, example of the large um, oil companies. They pay these steady in income, steady dividends. You move all that into solar, these are startup companies, they have no dividends. And so a lot of people have been depending on this dividend income in their portfolio, and they can sell it all and realize, oh my God, I'm, I'm not getting this check, dividend check I need anymore. Then of course, is the market environment, is it in the right time now, is it, is it the right time to, to sell uh, right now? Um, 
it, it would be a great time to sell oil stocks if you did have that high appreciation to so you wouldn't get as highly taxed. Um, belief may say you'd sell it anyway, but traditional economic stock theory would be that the, the oil companies may rise again and then sell them. But that's that's tactical. And then the security reserves research, you have to do research before you start, you know, just saying I'm just gonna invest in any old thing. I think after this yeah, so this, I'll let this go. This is like some current investment ideas and things, but it, uh, I think we don't need to do that. So, and I will somehow turn this off. <laughs> Did have any, 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 are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Or, there any, um, or a discussion? Or what do you want to do? Why don't you show your current investment ideas slide? I don't know, that seems like a good one. Uh, well, it goes on for about 10, yeah, okay. ten slides. Well, well, you can have a wider conversation than yeah. Bill. You want to switch up? The, uh, so he may not look like a fire-breathing radical, but this scares the oil companies. This discussion about like stranded assets is actually going to really push things along. Um, the oil companies have like five times more oil on their books as they value them themselves. They're going to allow them to burn, and uh, the more serious our movement gets about pushing divestment, the more that that is going to seem stuck to them. And we are going to win this. This is uh, taking over college campuses. Uh, divestment movement has been um, strong at Harvard and the important thing about divestment is we get to have an argument in public about what's righteous for the future and uh, institutions that have some moral accountability like a college can be, be brought to bear. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to invest in a future we want to live in and which means uh, solar power and the opposite of oil. So, Bill Aberge. So, um, my name is Bill LaBerge. I've been working with uh, Theo on his group called Transition Town Manchester since 2008. And our goal has been to, uh, to get our community to get off of fossil, fu fossil fuels in response to climate change. And so, uh, just recently, I, I, I've made custom furniture for 26 years. Uh, just recently, I've, I've switched my, my work uh, to my life's mission, mission, which is to get the planet off of fossil fuels. So now I, I uh, have my solar company, Grassroots Solar, and, uh, and I'm glad to follow up Todd because uh, Todd is talking about an investment portfolio, and what I want to talk about is um, getting off of uh, your, I want to talk to you about your consumption portfolio, and I'll be really quick, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through a lot of the details of specific uh, pricing and everything, but, um, but I'd like to tell people as we start to go through, we're looking at what their solar capacity is for their house. Um, you know, the, the best energy investment that you make is the energy that you're not, you're not having to spend money on. You know, weatherize your house, the lowest of low-hanging fruit. If you're, if you're spending $4,000 a year to heat your house and you can cut that in half, then you've got an extra $2,000 to, to go to Todd and look at some, uh, some socially responsible investing. So, so there are ways um, that you can do that. Really easy, uh, when, we, when I go through somebody's house, I'm going to try and figure out what their energy consumption is, talk to them about their appliances, uh, get a fuel efficient vehicle, um, look at your heating system. So there are a number of ways that, um, that you can do that. And now I want to talk about um, saving money by investing in solar power. Uh, what we're talking about is reducing or eliminating your electric bills. Solar can give you a, a positive double digit tax free return on your money. Um, and by tax free, what happens is um, you're going to generate all these kilowatt hours with the solar panels that, you're, that you have, that's gonna zero out your electric bill. So instead of having to earn some money, take that money, pay your electric bills, you're gonna have, you're gonna take that money and be able to, again, send it over to Todd to do some investing, because it's gonna get zeroed out. Uh, there's also no sales tax on, on solar installations, um, so it's really good tax benefits. Um, as, the, as the price of utilities go up, your investment in solar goes up because the value is based on whatever it is you're paying per kilowatt hour. Um, so as the, as the price of the utility costs go up over the next 30 years, you're gonna, your values of your in solar investment is going to keep going up. Um, they've been showing pretty regularly now that uh, properties, houses that have solar on them, sell for fifteen dollars to $25,000 more than if they don't. They also sell quicker. Um, so. Uh, and then, obviously, the biggest thing is to get off of fossil fuels. Um, so that's what I'm really trying to work with, uh, with people on. Uh, right now, the, the incentives that are really working in people's favor, there's a 30% federal tax credit. 
there's in, in Vermont for residences and businesses, they have a um, net metering. So, so basically you've got solar panels on your rooftop or your property. Uh, they're gonna, there's a little generation meter that's going to be keeping track of how many kilowatt hours you produce. For every kilowatt hour you produce, they're going to pay you what the retail rate is. It's usually 15 cents plus an additional 5.3 cents. So you're actually, you know, you're paying 15 cents. You're getting paid 20 cents to produce it. Um, and for larger projects, it goes to 4.3 cents, um, but it's still a pretty good return. Then also for businesses, there's a uh, Vermont solar tax credit as well. And again, for businesses, um, you actually get to depreciate the equipment as well, just like you can do an accelerated depreciation. So, so for businesses, it's really easy to get a, a high double digit return on your investment. Um, the, the, this is a, a brief description of the, uh, the net metering program, and I just explained it to you. So if you, gener if you consume 1,000 kilowatt hours and, and you generate 500, I just did the math here for you, uh, you're going to end up being only billed for 200 kilowatt hours because you generated 800 and it's zeroed out most of your bill. But you're getting this bonus of 5.3 cents per kilowatt hour. So with that bonus, you actually end up with a, a a, a net of twelve dollars and sixty cents. You have a credit on your electric bill. Uh, so then, what happens is though you build up. We, we try and uh, look at your annualized consumption for the year, and that's why I was talking about um, your portfolio of consumption. How much do you use? Uh, it may be that you have the capacity on your roof to produce more than you use, so you can do what my wife and I did and get an electric car. So we can produce electricity. Now we've taken fossil fuels out of our driving around. We've, we've eliminated, we were paying $200 a month for gas for our cars. We were able to eliminate that. Um, so we look at what your annualized costs are. Um, and then there's, uh, I'm going to talk about group net metering. So right now, I mean, the, the net metering program uh, basically is set up so that if, if I have land or rooftop space, I can put up solar panels and I can put Theo's uh, electric account on it. I can put, if my daughter has a place up in Burlington, I can put her on it. Um, so we can, uh, as a group, we can put together, there's a lot of community solar going up now. Uh, we have people here that are, that are doing that. Uh, so there's a lot of ways now that as a community, we can work together to get off of our fossil fuels. Um, so it's a really a, a great opportunity in, in Vermont, especially. And then, um, so this talks more about what the opportunities are. Um, a lot of nonprofits, you know, one thing about the federal tax credit is you have to have a tax appetite, which, which nonprofits don't. Um, so uh, a lot of groups are getting together and forming limited liability corporations, building a solar array. They get the tax credits. They get uh, all the, the write-offs, the depreciation. They donate the electricity to the church or whatever the nonprofit is. After seven years, they've depreciated the equipment. They can sell that equipment or donate it to the church. The church then has 30 years of free electricity. They've already taken out the tax benefits. So we've got some social uh, investors here, and, and I'm sure they can uh, get into some more details of that. But there's opportunities for community solar farms. Uh, if you can get a group of neighbors together, you can all invest together. Um, I'm going to just go through a few systems. Basically, they're all available for all of those incentives. This is a, a small rooftop array. Um, we do the um, All Earth Renewables, which is a local company here in Vermont. They do the All Sun Tracker. Um, we do some uh, ground mounts. And this, wow. uh, this is actually uh, <laughs> where I did that ground mount. This is the audience as we were installing it. Their uh, the llamas were, uh, and, and you can see the location where we're, where, uh, putting this. This is why I love my job. Um, and, and again, when I was talking about the portfolio of consumption, uh, and I keep saying this, uh, this friend of ours, she uses $4,000 a year in fuel oil. Uh, cold climate heat pumps will actually uh, use a third of that in, in electricity. So if you have the capacity to put up solar panels and produce electricity, then uh, these are highly efficient heating systems. So you start to look at you know, where, what parts of fossil fuels can you remove from your house? One, one guy had a gas dryer. His house had just been set up years ago. It had a bunch of gas appliances. He'd switch them all out except this gas dryer. Get rid of the gas dryer. You no, now no longer consume gas. He puts up the solar panels and he's, and he's powering his, his electric dryer. 
Um, here's our, this is my wife and I with our solar panels and, and um, like I said earlier, we're, we're driving an electric vehicle now um, and it's a really fun car to drive. Um, and I, I, I'll, I've got some numbers here. These are, are just examples. Um, obviously everybody's completely different, but I just want to show that um, this is a, a typical house, uh, 22 panels on it uh, after the federal tax credit. Uh, and it produces about $1,428 a year. You end up with about 10.5, 10 10.7% return on your money. You're investing $13,000, you're getting $1,400 the first year. Um, so it's a really good investment. That same one, what happens with commercial is they tend, typically tend to be larger. I just use those same num that same array of 22 panels, just for example, because you get the extra 7.2%. Um, so it actually ends up being 11.9% uh, return on that initial almost 12,000. For businesses, you also get to depreciate the, the equipment. So it, it's actually a higher return than that. Um, one thing that, that people in Vermont understand is that they pre-buy their fuel, they pre-buy their gas, or pre well this is, uh, solar is pre-buying your electricity for like, the next 30 years or so. Uh, this is uh, my information, I just wanted to talk about, you know, when we look at our getting off of fossil fuels um, and, and socially responsible investing, I think this is a really good way to do it. So, thanks for listening. All right. uh, Peter also and Sally, uh, maybe Sally, okay. ladies first. Jill, do you want to get the No, you go ahead. Um, and then we'll, we'll say, I'll say a couple things and we'll open up to the discussion. Maybe you'll uh, my name is Sally Dodge. I live here in Manchester um, with my husband, Dale Goldbranson, and we um, have been uh, involved in an impact investment company, which Todd talked um, briefly about, called Iroquois Valley Farms. Um, and the difference between, from our point of view, the difference between socially responsible investing, which is more screening, impact investment we see more as um, actually actively investing in something that's going to meet your your goals in an active active way um, Iroquois Valley Farms invests in um, farmland for organic farmers um, and has been doing that for about seven years eight years this is our eighth year um, and it, it, we, we start with the farmer first the farmer comes to us and says will you help me buy a farm we then identify that farm with the farmer and then the en other end of our spectrum is that we have actively been finding investors so we have the cash to be able to help that farmer get onto the farmland we work out a business plan with the farmer to make it affordable for that farmer and then we lease back to the farmer the farmer may buy the land after five years or so from us um, we require that the farmers be organic um, because that's the one way we can track sustainable um, farming. And um, we, Dale and I are very excited about this model. We, we represent the company. It started in Illinois and, and has been in the Midwest. We're now the um, Northeast representatives for the company. And the company is expanding now into New York, Maine, and hopefully Vermont soon. Um, the wonderful thing about this whole model for us is that through sustainable food production and sustainable soils, we see uh, this investment moving into um, you know, good, good jobs and land for farmers, which has been a real problem for, for young farmers to find affordable land. Um, and then secondly, creating healthy food for the citizens of the world, con creating healthy soils, and I'll go a little bit into that in a minute. I'm, I've become a healthy soil nut, uh, but I believe that it is the biggest way for us to, uh, through regenerative farming, combat uh, global climate change and sequester carbon in the soils. Um, it, we see it as a healthcare company because if we eat healthy foods, we're going to have healthier people. Um, what else still? We just see the whole company as coming full circle for the things that all of us want to represent. Well, I think touching a bit more on regenerative agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture, and the impact upon global climate change. I think uh, talking a little bit about that, Sal, would be so, good. So, 
2015 is the, has been declared the year of the soils. I don't know how many people really know that, but the United Nations does, and they're working hard on it. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Vandana Shiva, but she is um, a wonderful, sustainable uh, agriculture representative from India, and she's going around the world talking about uh, healthy soils. <clears throat> a lot of us are worried about Monsanto and the big chemical companies and GMOs. Well, one of the reasons, it's not just what GMOs are doing in our food or our um, insecurity about what it may, what they may do to our bodies, but the big thing about GMOs is that when somebody grows a crop, soybeans or corn with GMOs, they're also putting huge amounts of chemical pesticides, herbicides, and the, the burning uh, fossil fuel um, fertilizers on their soils. And most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about soil, but soil is created by lots and lots of little microbes, earthworms, things like that, that are in the soil. And as we put these chemical additives onto the soil, we're killing our soils and killing those microbes that create and process the carbon that, that comes in through photosynthesis into, um, into the plants and then, and then creates carbon and sucks carbon actually from. Hi, I'm Pete Drasher and um, I live here in Manchester, Vermont uh, for the last few years. Um, just I left traditional Wall Street about 10 years ago to start a nonprofit owned institutional brokerage firm and we gave our, to give our profits back to help low income communities and publish a research product around that institutional research around how to invest in low-income communities. Uh, but the last couple of years we've been focusing on the environmental sector and um, you know there's some amazing opportunities now to invest in the solutions. So one part of the, the, you know, the carbon issue is um, taking on the fossil fuel companies either through divestment or through engaging them, holding your shares and engaging them. And uh, you know, I think divestment is a is a certainly an important moral issue, and uh, it's been wildly successful in terms of raising awareness of uh, the carbon problem that we have. But the flip side of that coin is actually investing in the solutions to this, because we're we're going to need energy for a long time to come, and and uh, we're not going to get ourselves off of fossil fuels um, over the next 20, 30 years. Um, so in the interim, there are things like uh, natural gas is, is thought of as a, as a transition fuel um, because it has less emissions, although there's a methane problem with that as well. Um, but there's, there's other solutions. So we've been, uh, we've been researching and, and publishing research on some of the uh, investment solutions and in environmental investment solutions. Some is renewable energy, um, a lot of it is energy efficiency, um, whether it comes to buildings or, or cars. Um, and then there are things like, uh, you know, investments in water, investments in sustainable agriculture. Um, another report we just published uh, uh, last summer was on investments in natural ecosystems, like forests and wetlands, which now, for the first time, because of regulation, uh, is putting a price on those ecosystem services, like forests and wetlands, uh, you know, filter our water, clean our air. Um, and provide all types of sequester carbon, uh, produce oxygen, you know, all kinds of uh, essential services, and 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 the the regulation of the impacts on these ecosystems and those services is leading to uh, pricing through regulation, and that pricing is for the first time allowing us to actually invest in things like forests and wetlands through either through uh, sustainable uh, forestry funds that instead of uh, Harvesting their timber, um, you know, as intensively as possible. Actually, um, actually, uh, they they harvest it less intensely, and they monetize the ecosystem services, so they can produce the same types of returns as a traditional timber investment, but through a sustainable uh, focus. And um, so, anyways, the, these uh, ecosystem services are allowing us to invest in and conserve forests and wetlands through investment and um, but you know renewable energy there's a lot lot going on actually I had uh, lunch with an investment banker yesterday that, that assured me that in the next five years we're all we're not going to be driving electric cars we're going to be driving hydrogen cars 
because hydrogen, uh, I guess one kilogram of hydrogen can, can take you 50 miles. So these cars are going to have ranges of 500 miles. And, uh, and he assures me hydrogen isn't safe. I mean, the first thing I said was the Hindenburg, you know, but he said, no, that's, <laughs> everybody says that apparently, but, it, but it's much safer. Um, but so there's a lot, a lot of innovation and there's a lot of opportunities to invest in that innovation. So, you know, investing in environmental solutions is, is a great way to complement to uh, taking on the fossil fuel companies and, um, and you know it's going to fund fund the next the next big things that you know which ten years from now we'll be looking back at that and and saying you know that's that's business as usual now but today it's something that we're you know the new money is going into and that's that's an impact investment you know funding the solutions of tomorrow if you ten years from now when you're investing in this stuff it's not going to be an impact investment because everybody will be doing it but now you can catalyze the change with with investment so. That's uh, we publish research. As a matter of fact, we're working on a um, an advanced biofuels project right now that um, that will uh, not use corn or um, cellulosic trees, which they haven't figured out a way to make that profitable yet. But actually, use a dairy waste product from the production of Greek yogurt uh, to produce uh, ethanol. So uh, you know, that's I, mean, I think these solutions have to make sense. You can't be you know, producing ethanol from corn, it takes three gallons of water to make one gallon of ethanol, and I think you know twice the energy goes into it, making it that <laughs> comes out. So, uh, so you know, you need to find solutions that make sense and and also are profitable. So, thanks for your talk. Well, I'll, I'll bat last, and then uh, maybe we'll have a conversation and eat some chili. Um, so. Uh, so many good ideas about how to save the planet, and we should do a lot of them. Uh, one of the problems with the way the system is set up now is that the answers that Bill Line showed us, uh, and Sally also, are not what our society is doing as a, as a group. Um, oil is so much more profitable and so easy that uh, they're not going to go out of business on purpose. Um, <laughs> In, in good environmental news, the Vermont gas pipeline looks like it's on its last legs. Uh, after considerable public pressure on Governor Shumlin, um, he was pushing this very unpopular fracking gas pipeline. Uh, and I got involved with it because I met some of the people who were uh, farmers who were getting imminent domain letters to insist that they would put a frack gas pipeline on their land. Um, and so, Part of the problem is the, the companies, the oil companies have so much money they can hire lawyers and PR guys and uh, they can roll over the truth. Um, but what I'm seeing is a counter uh, measure to that is like our society is starting to value truth more. Uh, there's more accountability just because of the web and just because of uh, the sort of internationalism. Technology people talk about the singularity coming where like an information wave is coming uh, at the human race. And that seems to be happening in some regards. And it works to our side, because if you're um, trying to sell someone blowing up their water supply, there's accountability in that. People will eventually know. Um, so um, the um, personally, I'm more worked up about fracking and natural gas than I am about oil at this point. Um, studying how 3% uh, of the wells fail right away is basically saying that America is blowing up our water supply right now. I just think it's sort of damn unpatriotic. For all this sort of language we hear, rhetoric we hear about loving your country and voting for your president, like these people are willing to sell out our water supply. And I think we've just gotten to an age of accepting the unacceptable. Um, so. Part of what I appreciate about being the divestment movement and, and being part of the climate movement in general is that we get to stand up to the madness of the modern world. Um, Naomi Klein has a great new book called This Changes Everything. And in it, she's talking about, well, if we lived in a sane world, we would be doing X, Y, and Z. But we don't live in a sane world. We live in a world where they're blowing up the water supply and we're not planning for 50 years out into the future. And it's I mean, considering like how just how immoral that is for 
uh, a society to do at length. It's not only just lazy, but it's just, it's got a certain um, distasteful complacency with death. It's like if they were saying, okay, uh, these are the trains and they're going to a Polish forest and so come get on and go, we would be like, you know, no, no, we, we reject this design. Um, so, sort of vague re reference to the 20th century's like cruelties, but um, we live in a bubble when, you know, the uh, of modernity's wealth, when the antibiotics still work and we have not wrecked the sky yet and, you know, neo-fascists have not completely taken over our government. They're working on it, but uh, not yet. Uh, and we have to, I think, try to empower the better angels of our nature to run the world. And that means we have to like take care of our farms and take care of our, our people and and we should have the good sense to like plan ahead for a hundred years out. That's ethical and moral and it's just we've given up on some of our like um, anyway I, just, just to say core values core values. We, we have the right, the human race has a right to be better than this. You know, we struggled for a long time to get here. And we shouldn't just burn up the planet in five minutes because it's profitable for some oil companies. So let's do that. Let's stand together. And that's part of what's happening today. Global Divestment Day is happening all over the planet. And this is just the beginning of the something. We're not going anywhere. We have a long way to go. The oil companies are going to leave that, that oil in the ground. And uh, they're not going to profit from it. And, um, so watch out, Rex Tillerson from Exxon Mobil. You may not want fracking next to your property in Texas, but none of us want fracking, so. Um, <laughs> that's about all I have to say. Talk about our politicians. Talk about what's going on in Washington, what's going on in Montpelier, and the changes that we need to see there, and how those people need to start following some of our examples. Talk a little bit about that, Theo. Sure. Um, Citizens United and the sort of, I want to start there. Um, Russell Brand has a very funny uh, critique of voting. And he says, you know, people should not be so accepting of our like completely broken political system. But Donna Sheba said this when she spoke in Burlington. She said, I hate to come and address you when your democracy is in such bad shape. <laughs> and it's like, we've sort of accepted the situation where, like, they're all bought and nothing is working and we just send them our taxes and they continue to screw us and that's it. That's not acceptable. We have a right to a government that works, that serves us, that isn't corrupt, that plans a hundred years out. Is that, like, too much to ask? It's not too much to ask. Um, so I would like to see more people get involved with politics. I think we should, Reverend Steve Barry got elected in Manchester due to some of our help, and the Wilburton has supported that um, campaign. Uh, this guy is going to run for representative in Manchester in a few years, and maybe him and Dorset, and maybe you and a... <laughs> Robin Chestnut Tangerman. Robert Chestnut Tangerman. Um, so, uh, in general, I think we have a long future ahead of us, and we don't have to give up yet. Uh, the planet is still ours to save, and we should do that. So uh, we should have some, we have some chili to eat and maybe uh, take a picture of us as to celebrate. Uh, it'd be nice to have some community discussion too. Um, yeah, turn the camera off. Turn the camera off. Yeah, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> we can see what we really feel. <laughs>